Reverend Erhard Hermansen to, uh, to wish us welcome and uh, start the uh, meeting. The word is yours. Thank you, Lemma, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, good to see you all. My name is Erhard Hermansen. I am General Secretary of the Christian Council of Norway. And on behalf of Christian Council of Norway, I welcome you all to this Zoom based a briefing with Pastor Sunday Adelaya. And I will especially welcome you, Pastor Adelaya, to this uh, meeting here. I'm looking forward to listen to you and to have the discussion together with everybody who is participating here. And I'm also grateful that we, in this very demanding and difficult times, uh, and in the occasion of the International Day Against Racism, was able to arrange this meeting and especially that you made this possible for us, Pastor. The, the war in uh, Ukraine is deeply tragic and affects us all. The Russian attack in Ukraine is uh, reprehensible. It is a violation of international law and a serious blow to the state of peace that was established in Europe in the aftermath of the Second World War. And the Christian Council of Norway shares the world's community's com condemnation of the invasion and attack on a peaceful and democratic country. And we have said it before and said again that a ceasefire must be instated quickly and be succeeded by a lasting and just peace. And, and the Christian Council of Norway will also express our deepest sympathy with all who are affected, uh, the victims of the war. We share the pain and grief with people who must flee, are injured, and who have lost their loved ones. Uh, working uh, for peace has always been a central part of an ecumenical agenda. And for the Christian Council of Norway, as well for our co-working ecumenical organizations in Europe and all around the world, it's high on an agenda every day. And uh, at these days, it's even more. And through the media, we are constantly updated on the situation in Ukraine, and many of us are regular contact with friends and church employees in Ukraine. And, and it really, really affects us all. The human suffering is immeasurable. Many children, women and men suffer and are terrified. An accounted number of people, women and children are killed, and millions are fleeing to neighbor countries, escaping war. And as we have addressed this uh, Zoom-based meeting, uh, we have also raised the question, is it true that people of non-Ukrainian origin are being hindered to escape for life? And we have asked the que question, and Lemma will continue to uh, address this uh, together with uh, Pastor, uh, is what is really happened on the ground? And let me just, end my welcome and introduction with a closing point from the statement that we made from Christian Council of Norway a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we say that uh, we believe that love is the tool that God gives us to manage unjust and to live together in righteousness. Uh, love can open the way to reconciliation and peace and church must always be willing to open up those paths. Therefore, we continue to believe in prayer and dialogue, and we urge all congregations and churches to preserve in faith and prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the, ours and the whole world's peace. That is what we, how we ended our statement and what we believe in. We are working for peace together, and we are praying for peace together. And we are looking into what happened on the ground so we can be specific in our prayers and how we address the things who is going on. And uh, with that word, I would just say thank you. Welcome you all again. And I give the word to you, Lemma. Thank you, Reverend Arhard. And uh, let us bow our heads for a brief prayer. Lord, we thank you that we could meet again. And today, as we converse on this difficult subject, of pain and suffering. We pray for your blessings over our conversations and we pray for your mercy over 
Ukraine and for your peace over the whole world. Bless this time in Jesus' name, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. All wars are hell. The Russian war in Ukraine is nothing different. It is an infuriating act in all account. It must be condemned and it must be stopped. This is the message that everyone is uh, expressing and explaining. All parts of the conflict must swallow their arrogance to seek a peaceful way out of this misery. In the meantime, we all agree that people fleeing war deserve to be helped without preconditions of skin color or race. Unfortunately, but not unusually, the Ukrainian crisis is exposing the deep-seated racism and apartheid that people of African descent are facing in this world again, as we hear disturbing news of people of non-Ukrainian origin, especially Africans, were hindered to escape even in the days of tragedy. The other day, I heard an amazing story of kindness extended to Ukrainian pets and household animals so that they would escape also to safety. And I'm very proud of this kind of human action that happens in Europe. But the uncomfortable reality of people being mistreated, abused, and hindered makes me sad and cry day and night. In the midst of all this misery, there is one man whose story of facing and overcoming racism and the miraculous escape from this war stands exceptional. Right from the start of Ukrainian tragedy, I was wondering what happened to that person whom I have heard long time ago by the name evangelist, pastor, senior pastor, Sunday Adelaide. A few weeks ago, I took just a impulsive effort on Facebook and contacted him and asked, how are you doing? And that became a starting point for our conversation. Today, Brothers, sisters, we are privileged to have in our midst Dr. Sunday Adlaje, the founder and the senior pastor of the Embassy of the Blessed Kingdom of God for All Nations Church in Kiev, Ukraine. Pastor Sunday Adlaje has a, such a huge and big resume that I don't have the time to go through, but I am impressed of his ministries, the way God has used him and this, his story is the story of Job, the story of all African people, and the story of all people who want to preach the gospel, even in the midst of tragedy and difficulties. In our program today, Pastor Sunday will give us, starting with his own story of how he escaped the conflict and what has happened to his church, which was started some years ago from nothing and able to reach up to 100,000 members and the ministry that extends to 50 countries and um, what is happening, what is at stake for him, his family, his church, the people whom he has served, his visions about Ukraine, all of those things that he is going to give us a hint of his life, his ministries and the things he has faced and the, the status where he is now. With those few words, without going into all this enormous resume of uh, Sunday at Laje, it is my privilege to invite Sunday to take the word and to give us and guide us through and uh, speak for uh, uh, about 20 minutes-ish, and then we will be able to raise some questions for which he will respond, and with that, we will wrap up our meeting. With that, I give the word to you, Sunday, the word and the glory is yours. It is a pleasure to have you in our midst. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brother Lemma. Thank you so much, Herod uh, Hermanson. Thank you so much, everybody that have come here today to uh, answer this invitation and to you know, support uh, the efforts of stopping this war that's going on in Ukraine. Well, like you know, my name is Sunday Adilaja. I came over to the former Soviet Union uh, 36 years ago. I lived, I've lived in Russia, I've lived in Belarus, and I've lived in uh, Ukraine for the past, uh, uh, I've lived in Ukraine now for the past 30 years. So uh, we started, God helped us to start a church that is called the Embassy of God Church. 
and that church went to go to be a very successful church ministry, uh, very uh, big church, effective church. Uh, but today, uh, on the 24th of February, our life and our reality was shattered into pieces. Uh, when uh, Russia Federation and Mr. Putin decided to attack Ukraine. All of us in Ukraine, maybe 80% of the people, maybe 90%, including the president, uh, that this was possible. We didn't believe about it. Americans have been saying there is going to be a war, there is going to be a war, but nobody believed it. We didn't believe that this was possible. We were thinking, no, it's not, it's not possible because Ukrainians and Russians, they're like brothers. And uh, we thought Ukraine, uh, Russia will only take the, uh, we will only go in and take the uh, insurgent group of uh, the insurgent regions of Donbass. So we thought they would only take that region and everything will be okay. But attacking the whole country, uh, especially the capital. Uh, so I was awakened from my sleep at five o'clock almost and the shelling. You know, something scary, something that I will not wish my enemies uh, all the time. But nobody knows the difference. I I must apologize, but the, the line is the line is still uh, not stable. If the if the connection has some problems, I don't know. I know that you you had to escape the war and you had to find in a in a in a place that uh, in an I unidentified the or uh, in a in a different location. So I can understand if the internet line is not very good. But um, can we can we try again with uh, maybe. We take all the videos down so you can talk. Uh, maybe that would help the line. I think everybody else is hearing. I, I don't know. Can I, everybody say if it's good or it's not good? We, we, we had a, a problem for uh, some seconds or half a minute or so. OK, OK. So uh, what happened is uh, uh, the bomb woke me up from the morning in the morning uh, like it woke many people in ukraine up in the morning uh you don't need to wait to hear the about the war it, it, it came to you while you are sleeping so i've heard many people talk about wars before and i've, I've seen wars on television in video but it's different when you experience it it's very traumatic and um, even after, even weeks after you have escaped the war zone, you still feel at any time when there is a noise or when the plane flies or when the door is closed, you still feel as if the bomb is exploding around you. So it's a very traumatic experience for all these people who are escaping from Ukraine. So I want to encourage all of you if you know anybody that is escaping from Ukraine, please uh, give them the moral support that is needed. I know that God wants to use the body of Christ to touch uh, Ukrainians, especially the Ukrainians who are not Christians and use them to, uh, to, to, to use Christians to bring all these people to Christ, to make them, uh, receive Jesus Christ through the love that's going to be shown towards them. So, but thank God, uh, I was able to escape with my family 
and we let Ukraine, right now we are outside of Ukraine, thank God. So we are in a safer place right now. Uh, but a lot of our members are still in Ukraine. Some of, a lot of them have left. A lot of them are all over Europe already. Over, over 3 million people have left Ukraine. Uh, some people want to stay behind because the men are not being allowed to leave. All men from 18 you know, to 60 years old, they, they are not allowed to leave Ukraine. They must stay there to fight. Then the women and the children are the only ones who are allowed to stay, to leave. But also some women and children, I mean, some women also remain behind to take care of people who are suffering from the war and things like that. So yeah, that's the reality of what uh, has taken place. Now, there are a lot of reasons, there are a lot of things we could talk about why this has taken place. But what I want to talk about is that we should pray as Christians that God, God should help the world, that this will not turn to a third world war, that this war will not escalate. And also, I think we should also talk to our government. We should, you know, try to appeal to the people of the, to the NATO countries that they should not intervene because if they intervene, Russia says, Russia is going to attack them. And if Russia attacks, it's going to lead to a world war. But world war is not even the most uh, scary thing here. The most scary thing here is that it will be a nuclear war because Russia is no match to NATO, from NATO, NATO but they have a lot of nuclear weapons that could destroy our world uh, in an instant. So that's why I want us to pray that, that God should uh, help to stop this war and for it not to escalate. Now, there is another thing that uh, we have to talk about. Uh, Brother Lema spoke about it because today is International Day Against Racism and Discrimination. I have gone through a lot of discrimination all, all over the, the, my 35, 36 years of life in Russia and Ukraine. But today, uh, because of this uh, crisis, because of this war, the whole world was able to see uh, the problem of racism that black people and dark people have been experiencing uh, every day. But the, but the war didn't know, the war didn't know about this. So when people were escaping from the war and they would not allow black people and foreigners and who are black or dark skin to escape, uh, but they would actually allow the Ukrainians to go first, then their pets and their dogs to go second, and maybe after that they will allow the black people to go. So that was, uh, that is what people began to talk about it. So, but you know, war escalates and brings about, it exposes a lot of things. War exposes the heart of men. War exposes the good and the bad. So at the same time, why the, we could see some ugly pictures, there are also a lot of beautiful pictures. For example, in Poland, when we came to Poland, uh, millions of people entering to Poland and Poland and Polish people were so kind to receive everybody into their families. And in Poland, we don't have uh, outside refugee camps. There are no open space refugee camps. There are stadiums, there are in closed indoor stadiums or halls where they put people or in the families, but there is not, there are no ugly things. They are very, very well taken care of. And uh, ordinary Polish people bring a lot of things to help. I think more than 2 million people remain in Poland right now. And all other 1 million people are all over Europe. So we see the kindness of Europe. And we saw the decision of the European Union to accept uh, everybody coming to Ukraine, from, coming from Ukraine without any bureaucracy, without any visa documents and, and just help them, you know? So that is also about humanity, the goodness of man, the, of man that is being exposed through this situation. Uh, but like uh, Brother Herman has, has said, 
the whole world is suffering because of the uh, expenses, because of the inflation and everything. But that is nothing if compared to the escalation if that could happen if this gets to be third world war. This is what we all have to be careful about now, that this will not become a third world war. Now, that's what all I have to say for now. Uh, if you want to know about my family, my family is safe. That is the most important thing. Uh, my house is bomb was bombed, uh, but my house is nothing compared to all of that uh, destruction that have happened in the country. Uh, our people, uh, members of the church's houses are also bombed and destroyed, uh, but we have not re re recorded any death to our members of the church. The only problem is some of the members of the church who are in the military, they are, in, they are having problems uh, in the military. But otherwise, ordinary people, God has been protecting a lot of people, but a lot of people have died also. So, but I would be happy to answer all your questions that you might have at this time. Thank you, Sunday. I'm, I'm very pleased. And maybe before others to take a word and uh, since I don't see any of the, all of you in the video, now it's time to put the video and uh, raise your hands if you want to ask questions. Uh, also raise your hands uh, to ask questions. Um, if you could uh, Sunday before others uh, pose questions, if you could say a few words about your ministries and your church and how, how you came to R Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, a, a, bit, a little bit of a context. I, I have read a little more than others might have not yet read uh, about you and your ministry, how God has used you over the years. If you could add a few lines on that, adding also how you managed to stand with stand racism as well. Yes, uh, I came to Russia uh, when I was 19. I was a young man. I got a scholarship from the Russian government to study uh, journalism. So that's what I read in uh, in uh, Belarus. I studied journalism in Belarus, and uh, then I moved from Belarus to uh, Ukraine to work as a journalist. I was working as a journalist in Ukraine in the national television when uh, I felt that I had a call to start a church. So in 1994, uh, I was led to start this church. We used to call it Word of Faith. Then we changed the name to Embassy of God Church in Kiev, Ukraine. God blessed the work uh, greatly. Uh, we had 25,000 people in Kiev who were coming to church. We had over 40,000 people got saved from drug addicts and alcoholism. We had 300 uh, homes for drug addicts and alcoholics, rehabilitation centers, we call them. Um, many families were restored. Uh, we had 700 churches in Ukraine, 1,000 churches all over the world in about 50 countries. Um, but you see, when this war came, I had to run for my life with my wife and just with this one cloth, this cloth mm -hmm. and, uh, and a small bag. Uh, because it, what Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose everything? So our life and our wealth is not in what we have done or what we have or what we have achieved is in God, in Jesus. Jesus is our wealth. Jesus is our sufficiency. It's our provision is our everything. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the most important thing is that we have life now. And when there is life, there is hope. Mm -hmm. But before this happened, I had a revelation that two ministers came to our church. One minister came from England and prophesied this. But he prophesied this 2009. That's a long time ago. That's like uh, 20, is it 10? I don't know how many, uh, 12, I think 13, it's 13, 13, years. Years, 13 years now, 13 years ago. And he said he saw, he was seeing a war, a war between Ukraine and Russia. But everybody just said, okay, we're going to pray, but nobody believed it. Then another man of God from America came in 2014 
and also prophesied that he saw a war. But there was, at this time, we had a president that was pro-Russia, a president that was supporting Russia. So it, the, it was the good relationship. So nobody could believe it. Now, but the scripture that the, in Amos, where the Bible says, God doesn't do anything unless he reveals it to his, uh, to his servants. Now I know it's true. I knew before that it was true because it's the word of God. But now I'm seeing it practically that God actually revealed this. But it's, a pro it's another thing if we are going to believe it or not. So we prayed about it, that there will be no war, but we didn't imagine it. But also, I personally, myself, I saw the war. I saw the war come to Kiev because it's one thing to say there is going to be war between Ukraine and Russia, but I saw it come to my city and I saw the military men. When you look at television now, you see the way they are dressed, the military men dressed in gun and heavy. I saw all that. And that time people were not, military men were not dressing like this, but I saw them dressed like this in green. And they were carrying, and I saw them that they invaded my city. They invaded even my house. They came to my house. They came to the church, invaded the church, took over everything. I came to the church and I spoke to them about it, but we said we have prayed, so it will not happen. Sometimes we pray, but, but maybe sometimes some things, it's not because God is showing us not so that we'll stop. It's some things we cannot stop. I think some things God is showing us so that we'll be able to take action. Mm. But I think what we were doing is that we were praying for it not to happen. Mm. I think there are some things, we, we sometimes we don't know what to do when God reveals some things. Mm. That uh, God was revealing for us to take action, but we were praying. Mm. Even though when, that, when we got this revelation, especially from the man from England, he himself told me, give me the address of your prime minister. I gave it to him. Give me the address of your president. I gave it to him. Give me the address of your parliament. I gave it to him. So he wrote a letter personally as a prophet to all the government officials in Ukraine and told them what to do to prevent this war. But you know the way government people do? They just say, oh, this is religion. Religious people are fanatics. You people are extremists. You, this is rubbish. There will never be war. Now we're saying it. Amazing. Amazing. Others who have some questions you wonder, you want to raise uh, concerns that you want to raise, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and ask questions. Go ahead, Gabriel. Well, um, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for having, for coming on this platform. I, we share the same country of origin. I'm a Hausa boy. In the, that makes a lot of sense to you when I say that. Um, well, Hausa Christ, Christian. Yes, yeah, yeah, I know. It becomes, uh, and yeah, well, we could talk about that another time. <laughs> All right, so I... Um, I wonder how much of this war has revealed the social and political mechanisms, not exclusively, but specifically to, in the West, that you know encourages a continuous historical trauma of the black man and woman. Um, now, this is where you were tell, you're telling the story from a religious perspective. What is happening, you know, as a pastor, you have a shepherd's heart, but this is a an issue that transcends, you know, just our, our shepherds' heart, our shepherd hearts. This transcends what we would like to see as people of God. This is a reality of the African man. So, you know, how, how has this revealed this in a very concrete manner? And my other question is, what can the church do to, to bring about healing um, in, you know, in, the, in the lives of men and women that are darker skin color? What is the role of the church? Now we look at it historically, you know, we talk about slavery like it's a long time ago. We talk about you know uh, you know the imperial imperialism like it's long time ago, but yet we still live in the realities that you know take us back to those eras. What can the church do from your perspective, as a minister, as a shepherd, someone who loves God, and someone who's an African? What do you think the church in the West can do 
to encourage this collective healing, you know, from this collective suffering that we are seeing through this war? Uh, the issue of race, I think it has been handled very well in the West, better than it has been handled in the East. I think in Eastern Europe, you still have more problems with race. For example, I was telling you just now of how kind Poland is. Poland has been very kind to Ukraine and to Ukrainians. Poland received me, received millions of people. But that same Poland rejected other refugees because they are not like them. Even people like us, they would not have received me because it's not because I'm black they received me or it's because they, yeah, I have Ukrainian documents. If I don't have Ukrainian documents, they will not receive me. So, but I remember that Poland itself refused to take re refugees from Syria. They refused to take refugees from, uh, from all these East, you know, Muslim countries, from Turkey. They refuse to take refugees from Africa. Up to now, they don't take anybody that is not of historical European heritage. Yeah. Even though they are very kind. That was good though. Well, may I maybe spend it's chip. Good. Well, I, I, maybe it's good on if you are not the one suffering. But let's assume that you happen to be somebody who is of another skin let's say you are you are um you are syrian or you are afghan 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 you have war in your country you are not to blame that you are born you, i didn't choose to be born black i didn't choose to be born in africa and he did, they didn't choose also to be born in syria and he didn't choose to be born in uh, afghanistan and he didn't choose the war also. This war is a catastrophe. War is a tragedy. So when that tragedy come, when you, look, I too was thinking before this war came that, okay, this is happening to some people over there. But when it's happening to you, when you have to run for safety, anybody needs help. The, the same way I feel pain, is the same way Syrians feel pain. The same way I feel tragedy and sorrow and trauma, the same way Afghans also feel it. So every human being is the same. If you are going to use culture to judge or color to judge, then we are, you are supposed to justify the Ukrainians who say black people shouldn't enter the train. You, they, they deserve to, if that is the logic, then we could say, yes, they are justified. Black people shouldn't enter the train. Black people shouldn't be safe from the war. Let them die because they are black. So it's a big moral issue. We cannot say we will only save people like us. It, it, and Christian faith does not allow us to differentiate and put deprecation and separation that you are a human being, but you are a less human being because you have another belief. Or you are a human being, but you are a less human being because you have another color. And I think this is one of the things that all of us who are Christians, black Christians, we must let people know that humanity, human being is valuable in the eyes of God. Jesus died for all human beings. And when he died for me, my parents were idol worshipers. When he died for you, you were not Christian. He died 2,000 years ago. We were all pagans, Muslims or pagans. We were all the same. But we are lucky now to know Jesus. But even when we, were, we didn't know him, he died for us. So Jesus thinks that every human being deserves to be died for, even if it's a Muslim or a pagan or idol worshiper. Jesus still sees the worth and the value in human being. So this is what we saw in Ukraine also. When people were coming out of Ukraine, they were not allowing black people to go out from the war. And this was going to kill them. Bombs were coming and you said they cannot go. How do you understand that? 
then when they struggle to come out, you push them back and say, you are not Ukrainian, you, you can, but he cannot survive the bomb too. The bomb will kill him just like it will kill Ukrainians too. So we cannot use culture or religion or uh, color of the skin to say who we are going to help or who we are not going to help. This is, these are some of the tragedies that war should teach us that everybody must be treated as human being first. And the church has the responsibility to uh, spread this news and spread this information to the world, I think. Very good. Very good. Thank you. It's touching. Any more uh, questions uh, others want to raise? I, I, I know that uh, Pastor Sunday's story is quite a fascinating one uh, to see him uh, serving as perhaps he is the, the first <laughs> black pastor in the whole Caucasian uh, region of uh, Europe uh, where he is serving a large number of people of Slavic uh, background where he is pastoring about 99 or 98% of people are not black as such, but Christ transcend this the limitations of race and color is manifested in your life and in your ministry. And I, 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 I earlier asked you about how did you manage? How did you manage to tolerate? Uh, how did you manage to tolerate uh, all kinds of abuse and discrimination? And somebody is also asking, uh, here somebody is asking, uh, AA is asking, uh, Pastor Sunday, what do you think can stop the war? So if you add that question too. Yes, uh, concerning uh, how we were able to resolve, I, I was able to break through in the midst of discrimination and nationalism. In Ukraine, Ukraine is one of the most nationalistic countries in Europe, very national, just like Poland, very nationalistic. But, you know, God gave me the wisdom because when I was a Christian, when I came as a Christian to Ukraine, all the black people were only meeting with black people only. And when you eat, or not just in Ukraine, maybe in Europe also, when I go to England, I see black people have church, but only for black people like them. Uh, some Nigerians have church only for black Nigerians like them. Uh, all that everywhere. Ethiopians, just for Ethiopian black people like that. They don't assimilate with other people in the culture. They don't uh, bring the local people in. So when I saw that problem, I said, no, God didn't send me from Africa to Europe only to sit down with my fellow Africans also and create a mini culture, uh, monoculture. I said, no, I will not sit with Africans. I have to learn the language of these people, learn their culture, and try to see how I could bring them in and make them to accept the gospel. Uh, but what happened is when I try to do that, at first, I meet with discrimination. So, for example, they could come to touch your hair and say, oh, what's that? Is it wire you have there or is it grass or things like this? But when they do that to other pe black people, even Christians, black people, they get angry and they want to fight. They want to fight them. But I, God gave me, so I don't know how, some wisdom that when they laugh at me or call me monkey or things, I say, oh, monkey, no problem. Would you like to get a big hug from a life, a living monkey? So I try to hug them. I said, hug a monkey, real life. They laugh. And they, they say, yeah, since it's giving you joy, you are laughing, it's making you happy. I'm happy. Use me to be happy. Use me to, to have a good day. You know, I, sometimes I give them my hand. I say, you want to shake a life, life monkey, a living monkey? Good. Test it. Come and shake it. You want to find out about the hair? Go, go. Do anything you want. You see? <laughs> These are the things that uh, I made myself a laughing stock. I allow people to laugh at me. I allow, allow them to ridicule me because I know what I was after. I know if I could do that, humble myself 
be humiliated a little bit, but to get their trust that later on they will get to know my inner content, my character, my personality, my virtues. My, and they will, when they see that, they will change their attitude. And that is what happened eventually. So from laughing at me, they began to hear and listen to me, how I speak with an accent, their language. They get shocked that I speak their language with their accents, with their proverbs, with their adage, with their stories, with their culture. That's how the respect and the, and the attraction began to come in. And through that, we began to, God began to help us to build the church. And before you know it, our church is not just 10 people in our church or 100 people or 1,000 people. This is a church of just in city Kiev, over 25,000 people. And all of them are 98%, maybe 99% are all white Ukrainians, Russians, Jews, Europeans, everybody, but not black. Only about 100 or 200 people are black. So, uh, you know, because sometimes as Christians, I learned from uh, Apostle Paul, and what Apostle Paul said is that if we want to win the Jews, we should have to be like the Jews. If we want to be, win the Greek, we have to be like the Greek. If we want to win you know, the Gentiles, the same thing. So I knew that I had to pretend to be like them as much as possible. In fact, I was learning their culture so much that I forgot my native language. I, couldn't, I can't speak my Nigerian language anymore because of learning their culture and language so well. But it has paid because it helped me to be able to penetrate into the culture. Now, the second question you ask is, how do, we, how do I see the end to this war? I think the best way to end this war is through negotiation. But negotiation also means compromise. Mm -hmm. That is the problem. Ukraine, if I, I come from Ukraine, I see myself as Ukrainian, and we are the victims. We are the ones that was attacked. But if we want this war to stop, we must be willing to also compromise some things. But that is a big problem for us because what Russia is asking us to compromise is, is suicidal for every Ukrainian. No Ukrainian will agree to those conditions. That is why the war is still going on. But if we want to stop the war at all costs, then we have to compromise and be willing to lose some things so that we'll gain the peace. So this is where the problem is. Number second, the second way we, the, we could end this war is for NATO to stop supplying weapons to Ukraine. But for me as Ukrainian, I want them to supply because I think if they supply, it will help us to win the war or to stand against Russia. But the problem is, do we just want to win the war and then see a country that is destroyed and no, nobody left? It's, one, it's another tricky issue. Mm -hmm. if, because if, we want, if they keep on supplying the weapon, war will never end. It will keep on going, and every day the war is going, is destroying the country, is destroying the people, is killing people. So, do we want to win at all costs when nobody is left? Or so that is the moral question. So we want to we want to win. We we want NATO to keep on giving us the weapons, but what would that lead to? Maybe that's why Jesus said go and sit down with your adversary, with your enemy and negotiate. Even if it's a bad peace, but a bad peace is better than a good war. Then another thing, another way this, we could make this war to end is for NATO, not, no, no NATO country should intervene. If they intervene, that would lead to a third world war and a nuclear weapon war that could destroy the whole world. Oh. Somebody posed the question to you here, uh, Pastor. Uh, maybe that is one of the last questions, if somebody else has any question. 
What is your advice for Africans who has lived very long time away from their home country to avoid being displaced? Should there be war situations such as in uh, Ukraine and Russia? Uh, he is sort of kind of asking, like in your case, uh, after you have identified yourself as Ukrainian, have lived and served and built up all your life, suddenly there is a war where you can at the end of the day become like also homeless again. What is your uh, what is your uh, what is your reflection on that? I really want people to learn from my situation because uh, I embraced Ukraine and Ukraine people so much that I forgot sometimes that I'm African. And maybe it's a problem. I thought it was positive before because I thought I was facing my mission and my mission was in Ukraine and I embraced Ukraine and I was focused. That's what I thought. But who knows that this kind of thing will happen in life. So maybe people will learn a lesson or two. Maybe it's better not to put all your eggs <laughs> in one basket. <laughs> maybe it's, with, it's wise to always uh, know where you are coming from and also have some roots or some investments there. I didn't have, I don't have any investment in Africa, in Nigeria. I don't have any home or house there. I didn't, you know, I never thought but even though God has spoken to me that also, this is another good thing, God revealed to me that I have to go back to Africa, but I've not gone back yet. I was, I'm still here when this happened. So uh, it could be a lesson for everybody not to, not to, uh, you know, not to collapse, or not to break the bridge or what do you call it? Well, not to bomb the bridge, uh, not bomb the bridge, not to bomb the bridge after yourself when, because you are successful in Europe. Another lesson is, even me, I'm not just one of the most successful black people in Ukraine. I am one of the most successful people in Ukraine, either black or no black or white or foreigners or Ukrainian. One of the most successful person in that country, period. Still, I suffer from discrimination and racism. So that will also tell us something that maybe when everything is good, you might not see the problem. But when, God forbid, a crisis comes and the people themselves need to survive, they don't think about you first. They think about themselves first. So that is also another thing that I have to talk about so that anybody could learn their lessons from my ordeal and from my tragedy. Wow. Pastor Sunday, uh, Gabriel has uh, last the word of reflection or question. So this was very nice. <laughs> it's not. It's not a revelation, but this for, for me being someone who has studied, uh, you know, theology and is concerned about uh, society and politics. It reminds us that you know what the West has promised as far as or what uh, Western societies and I include Ukraine in my Western or you know term or maybe I should use European, uh, I think that that the whole idea of, li of the world being a global village or the idea of liberal democracies promising um, security and the, uh, and, uh, and the pursuit of happiness for, uh, for all, that, that, has been, that, that has been questioned with this crisis. You know, am I at home in Norway or am I not in, at home in Norway? Uh, what makes me Norwegian? Is my citizenship in Norway enough to protect me and my goods and my family and, you know, uh, my future? Or, you know, or is it not? You know, I, I might, how, how long do I, should I continue feeling like a second class and creating plan Bs and Cs and Ds uh, when you know, in the, today's world we're talking inclusion, diversity? It just shows us how much these terms have no long-term consequences. They're just fancy political terms provides bureaucrats jobs in the office. Sorry that I'm saying this way. I, I feel like all of a sudden my security is standing on a thin straw. <laughs> uh, and then I'm, I, I, I wouldn't say that I've forgotten my roots. I'm proudly a Northern kid from Nigeria, but the last years I'm proudly Norwegian in the sense that uh, Norway's fate and destiny also lies in my hands to, to a certain extent because I'm a statesman, I'm a contributor in this society. My children identify with this society. So why shouldn't I feel at home in one place? Why do I always 
have to make plan Bs and Cs. And then the last question is, you know, um, Africa is not any better in many ways. Um, where does the kingdom of heaven and the future hope that we as believers hope for, hope for how does it fall into this picture of what you just said? I think at the end of the day, for me, my conclusion after this whole thing is that heaven is my home. Mm -hmm. And that uh, heaven is my home. The kingdom of God is not in this world. The kingdom of God who come to this world to change this world, but eventually heaven is our home. And that, uh, you know, anything could happen to me in Nigeria or Africa or here or in Europe, in Ukraine, at the end of the day, my treasure must be where my heart is. My heart must be where my treasure is. And I must make sure that my treasure every day is not in my house, my church, my uh, congregation, my color, my country, that my security and my, uh, my confidence, my uh, treasure is in the things of heaven, things that are not physical things that are not material, uh, things that are not, you know, that are not tangible, but that are very eternal. And that is my conclusion. Oh, that's very nice. Well, uh, Pastor Sunday, that was very beautiful. And it's uh, worthy to consider and worthy to remember. I think uh, we these are really deeper conversations and which we need to keep on and uh, struggle with and, um, I'm very happy that uh, we got this little glimpse into, into the day. And um, as we wrap it up, I want to ask uh, Pastor Sunday, uh, what are your thoughts about uh, here? Uh, Tiza is writing, we are all pilgrims on earth indeed. Um, I want to give uh, Pastor Sunday some, uh, some uh, few moments to just give us a way forward in terms of how could churches uh, assist you and your ministries and your congregations and the people of Ukraine. What 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 are your your advices to us, uh, to the Christian Council, to Erhard, and to, to all of us who are attending here, and to people who want to stand with you in your difficult time. Okay, the most important help is uh, understanding understanding the need of these people. Right now, can you imagine somebody who had a car or a house or an apartment or just home, a home? Now, he doesn't have anything. You are just naked. You could be a millionaire, even a billionaire before. If your wealth and everything is in Ukraine, you cannot get anything from the bank. You cannot get anything. You cannot, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are reduced to nothing. You are reduced to a refugee. So the first thing I want to tell people is the Christian church must be ready to embrace these Ukrainians with love, mm. just to give love and protection mm. and let them know that we understand and we want to support you. Mm. Number two, if they come to your country, give them something, give them food to eat, give them clothes to wear, hug them. Because right now, at this, the way Ukrainians are, they are so broken and, and, uh, and they are broken right now. They are so weak and uh, so vulnerable. Mm. So because of that vulnerability, they are ready to receive uh, any help and they are ready to receive Jesus Christ. So anything you tell them now, they will do it. Anything you tell them, because they are very vulnerable, they are very broken. So if they didn't know about Jesus Christ before, if you tell them about Jesus Christ, they will come, they will, they will receive him. So if the church could begin to now show that the church is love and be able to give help to as many as you can, the best, that is the best help. And for those in Ukraine, also, we could also do the same thing. If we could send some help to them, it will also be a great blessing to, the, to those people who are suffering. 
with those words, I think uh, we have to come to an end of this session and uh, may I leave the word to, um, uh, to Reverend Erha to please express our collective gratitude to Reverend and Pastor Sunday. And uh, we I'm very pleased, blessed to get to here to, to listen to your uh, wonderful stories and to your inspiring uh, wisdom. And uh, Erhard has the last word. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Sunday, for everything that you have shared with us and also that you're for your good reflections of the questions that have been raised. Uh, I'm, as I said in the introduction and the welcoming, I'm glad that uh, during the time that we have, that we were able to have this meeting today. So thank you so much. And also thank you so much, everybody who has participated. And as you can see, if you look into the chat, there are so many people who raise thanks to you at the moment. So please take all the thanks with you and may God bless you and God be with you in your ministries, wherever you are and uh, uh, at, the, at the moment uh, outside the country that you normally serve. But uh, I thank you on the depth of my heart from all of us. Thank you and God bless you. And thank you all for participating and have a nice day further. Also Sunday, thank you very much again. And uh, the, the meeting is officially uh, adjourned, and so we can. Uh...